Well, thank you, Cornerstone Ensemble and Cornerstone and for all of what you've been singing tonight. And what a, what a wonderful song, Jesus is the Answer. I told some of you that once I found a book in a New Orleans bookstore about graffiti. And it seems that some man had traveled all over our nation and had studied for several years what was written on the walls of public places and subways and on outdoor walls and slums. And he did a study of, of graffiti. And the most interesting chapter in the book was a, was a chapter entitled Progressive Graffiti. And this was a situation where someone would write a thing on a wall or on, or on a something, subway or something, and, and then someone would come along and write under that, and maybe someone else would add to that. Uh, like one fellow wrote on a wall, uh, to be is to do, John Paul Sartre. Someone came along and wrote under that, to be or not to be, Shakespeare. And then someone wrote under that, do be, do be, do be, do, Frank Sinatra, you know, that kind of thing all, all over the place. Uh, it was... Uh, uh, one man who wrote, uh, Christ is the answer. And someone wrote under that, what is the question? And someone wrote under that, whatever the question, Christ is the answer. Well, that's kind of like what Psalm 22 is about. I, uh, I've become fascinated in these past several weeks with, with the 22nd Psalm. We talked about it last week and talked about the kind of interplay. It, play is not the right word. The, the kind of understanding that Jesus had dying on the cross with the people who were tormenting him because they were quoting Psalm 22 back to each other. When Jesus said in, in the very beginning of the time, Lord, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And we sure recognize that as one of the seven last words from the cross, but it's also the very first verse of Psalm 22. And then after a while, you, you'll read how that there is a line in there that says he saved others. He cannot save himself in a, in a taunting kind of way. And you remember that the Pharisees, the people who were sponsoring the crucifixion of Christ and chore, chore, choreographing the whole thing, these people uh, were the ones who were saying he saved others. He can't save himself. They knew they were quoting the 22nd Psalm back to each other. You remember there is that one line in there in verse 18. They divide my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. So when you read the 22nd Psalm, you, you just live at the cross. Uh, you find yourself drawn back to the cross where Jesus died that day and, and yet a kind of a fresh insight on the crass kind of way these intellectual people were making fun of him. And, and as he was quoting back to them the 22nd Psalm, I think he was saying to them, there's more to it than this. And he was saying, God has not forsaken me. As we talked last Sunday night, when we asked God, why have you forsaken me from the stillness of his own dark? He says, I have not. And one of the reasons we know we are not forsaken and that God is with us, is that he enters into those darknesses. In fact, he's been there before we have. And uh, we have a God who, doesn't, who isn't removed from us. He's not just an all-powerful and almighty God who is up there somewhere but doesn't really know what we're experiencing. Uh, he knows, and he's been there. And when we feel like saying, my God, why have you forsaken me? The answer is out of his perfect darkness because he's been there too. I have not forsaken you. And I'm convinced that's what Jesus was saying. The last part, beginning in verse 22, the psalm changes completely. It goes all the way from why have you forsaken me? And then in the last verses, 17 and 18 and following there, he says, but you, O Lord, be not far off. Uh, Deliver my life from the sword. O oh, my strength, come quickly. Rescue me from the mouths of lions. Save me from the horns. Uh, here he's acting as, or you, you get the impression that there, there's no hope. And suddenly, without any kind of transition, the whole thing changes. And this psalm becomes a psalm of prophecy of victory. That somehow what Jesus is going through now, he understands, is going to bring glory to God. And it's going to bring salvation to people. In verse 22, I will declare your name to my brothers. In the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him. Revere him, you descendants of Israel. For he has not despised or disdained the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. 
from you comes the theme of my praise in the great assembly. Before those who fear you, I will fulfill my vows. The poor will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nation will bow down before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. All the rich of the earth will feast and worship. All who go down to the dust will kneel before him. Those who cannot keep themselves alive, posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim the righteousness to people yet unborn, for he has done it. How quickly, how quickly has this dark darkness of the cross, the feeling of forsakenness been changed as we come into the light of what's happening because of that and what it means to have a Lord who enters into the darkness with us, who dies on the cross for our sins. This is, this, this is, a, cross, this is a, a psalm that's recognizing that you and I are in a bind. We're in a worse bind than we like to admit. Uh, we have this, we're being bound by a thing called sin, and our society likes to make light of it because it doesn't want us to see how serious a thing it, is, it really is that we have, and we need rescue. And our Lord is going through this time, the process of, of rescuing us, of taking us out of our sin because he's dying for our sins. And it's amazing as you think about the cross and think about this thing that's happening, that this worst thing, I mean, what worse thing could there be than God in his love coming down here? than God in his gracious, wonderful love coming and living a perfect life among us. And he never hurt a blessed soul. He went about doing good. He healed, he fed, he most of all taught people about God's love and about God's grace. And this worst thing of all is they killed him for that. And in most crimes, you've got the picture of the guys with all the tattoos all over their arms or the people who are dirty and ugly and, and the outcast of earth, that they're the ones who are doing these things. It's not so. It is people like you and me who are doing this. It is the upright people of the community. It is the civic leaders of the community. It is the respected religious leaders of the community. They're the ones who are doing this. They're the ones who are putting Christ to death. It's not the criminal element. It's just the opposite. And we look at this, can there be anything worse than that? Can there be anything any worse than that? And yet out of this very worst of all things that's ever happened in history comes the very best, the very best thing. When we think about our Lord dying on the cross and, and where they killed him. I think you have to go to the city dump to get a good picture of that. If you can see the rusting, chrome-peeling, disbanded cars, if you can smell the burn of automobile tires being consumed by fire, if you can smell the rotted thing of furniture that's deteriorating, it's been thrown away because it's broken, if you can see the rusted tin cans and the springs of somebody's bed long ago thrown away, imagine those kinds of surroundings, and there you imagine the surroundings of the cross because it was close to the city garbage dump that they killed Christ because that's where they threw the bodies of these people they didn't want. You see, the cross and that kind of death was about being rejected. Like the garbage around Christ had been rejected said he came into his own and his own received him not but as many as received him to them gave he the power to become the sons of God the scripture we studied in church this morning says that he's the chief cornerstone and yet many people have rejected him and put him aside uh, this is the picture of the cross this is that worst thing that ever happened that became the best thing for you and me and the sad thing was it was not the openly wicked in the criminal element. It's people like you and me, and I've got to keep repeating that. We've got to face that in a moment. It was that kind of people that killed him. All kinds of interesting myths have come about the cross. I, I read this week that there's some people who actually believe that the wood that, that the cross was built of, that Jesus was crucified on, was the same apple tree in the Garden of Eden. 
that Adam and Eve ate the fruit from. Well, of course, the Garden of Eden probably didn't have an apple tree. The Scripture doesn't say anything about an apple. It just says a tree of the fruit. But someone has fancied the idea that that cross was fashioned of the same tree that Adam and Eve took the fruit from and ate of it when they started sin in the world. Well, that's a mythical thing, but it really is true, isn't it? It really is true. That cross is shaped from that event and from all the times that you and I have sinned against God, from all the times that we have displeased him and dishonored him. It's a, somebody said the sour apple tree that Jesus was nailed upon for you and me. But why, why is it that those who have the hardest time understanding Jesus are the people like these religious leaders, the people like you and me, who turned him down, who in a kind of a name of civic duty had him put to death. I mean, in their own rationalization, they literally, they literally believed that they either had to take the life of Christ or maybe lose the freedom of their nation. They didn't have freedom anyway. Isn't it strange how hard it is for people who see themselves as the best in the community to think they need Christ? Isn't it strange how the religions that the best in the community seem to invent is the kind of religion that says, well, I am a good person and I will go to this ceremony and I'll do these things and, and this will verify that I'm the kind of... But the idea of needing Jesus Christ to die on the cross to pay for their sins is a hard thing for some people to take. And I think it's because... Well, we're kind of like people who cannot see our own disease. You and I may have all kinds of problems inside our body. We may have clogged arteries. We may have diseased hearts. We may have tumors growing in our lungs. We may have all kinds of, of terrible and tragic things going on inside of our bodies, but we can't see them. All we see is just the outward stuff. We look at the skin. It looks all right looks healthy, everything looks fine, there's nothing wrong there. I think we do that with our spiritual lives. There's no doubt about the diagnosis that God has given to us, is there? There's no doubt about what he means when he says there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's no doubt about that, but we just like to see what we can see. Of course, Many of us know that we're worse than other people see us, and we kind of keep that a, a secret. But many of us don't even know how bad we really are. We don't know we have those diseases, those things inside of us that are ugly and terrible, because, you see, only the Lord has the x-ray, and he sees us. And so often it's hard for some people to believe they need Jesus Christ, especially among the best people of the community. Just hard for them to believe that Christ is a need of their heart. Interesting, interesting thing. Well, tell me, do you think Christianity is gloomy? All this sin talk, preacher, you know, all this trying to make us feel bad, all this trying to see these things. No, that's really not the idea at all. Not the idea at all. The idea of Christianity is that the great physician has come along and said, I have honestly diagnosed your disease, and I can cure it. You don't have to be afraid of it. I can handle it. It is not fatal for you if you'll come to me. I can cure your disease. I, I've diagnosed it. You are a sinner. The wages of sin is death. But I have come and the cross is God saying, this is what I've done for you to build a bridge between here and eternity. This is the bridge to everlasting life. I know your illness is serious, but we can cure it. We can save you from it. We can give you eternal life. Tell me, where do you put the emphasis when you think of Christianity? What, what's the most important event in Christianity? Is it the cradle, the incarnation, God become flesh dwelling among us, and Jesus actually growing up, God actually coming to our earth and becoming one of us? Is that the most important thing about Christianity? 
Or is it the cross? The cross, this worst thing that ever happened, which became the best thing that ever happened? Is that, is that the emphasis of Christianity for you and me? I think the emphasis should be the empty tomb. I've never seen anybody wearing little empty tombs around on their lapels. For that's what Christianity is about. It's a joyous religion. Back before the Eastern Orthodox religions became so involved in the politics of the thing, especially in Russia, the thing that characterized the worship of the Eastern Orthodox Church was the celebration of life that God gives us. It was a time of joy. The empty tomb can be looked upon as nothing more than joy. You can look at the cross and have a, a lot of different kinds of feelings, and the cross is so very important. And you can look at the cradle and see all that that involves, and, and you say, that's wonderful. But the most wonderful thing of all is the empty tomb because it says, you see, that you don't have to stay in your tomb, that you will live forever, that nobody's going to put you down to stay when you know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. It means life has been transformed. And not just saying, well, when I die, I'm going to go to heaven, much more than that. Life is transformed now. Life means that you can, you can live now and not be afraid of dying. The empty tomb means that you can, you can begin to live now and extend that into eternity. The life begins not after you die, but it begins when you know Jesus as Savior, the Jesus who came out of his tomb. And I think all of this is being said in these verses that I read to you. It's saying that this is the pathway to forever. That our Lord Christ on the cross was not being just gloomy when he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He was saying, I quote to you the beginning of a chapter which ends with a wonderful thing. They will proclaim his righteousness to people yet unborn, for he has done it. Jesus says the last word is not torture. The last word is not humiliation. The last word is not agony. It is not grief. The last word is not death. The last word is life and love because God gives you life because he loves you. And that's the last and final word of Christianity. God says, yes, you're foolish to act as though you don't have the sin disease, but I can be your great physician and we can cure it and you can live forever. Let's bow in prayer, shall we? Dear Lord, we thank you so very much that you came to earth. We thank you so very much that you allowed yourself to be nailed to that tree, and when your back was pressed against the unbending stiffness of that cross, it was our sins that you were feeling. But Lord, we thank you that the last word is life, the last word is an empty tomb. The last word is a wonderful hope. The last word is the joy and transformation that you bring us when we make Christ Lord of our lives. We thank you, Lord, that the most wonderful, forceful, and fitting symbol of all our faith is the empty tomb and the life it promises. Thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. We want to invite you to come and make your decisions to accept Christ as Savior or share with us that you have to join our church, uh, to rededicate your life, to let us know that God has called you into some kind of particular special service to his glory and honor and, and your honor, and we can pray with you about that. I don't know what God is doing among you, but I know he's doing something. And I know there are people here who have decisions to make, and I know there are many, many people who will rejoice to see those decisions made. Let's stand quietly and reverently, and you come now and do God's will.